I've titled this sermon today, God Hears the Worship of Puny False Gods. God Hears the Worship of Puny False Gods. If you did any reading ahead, you may know why I've titled it that today. If you're new to us and have not been here during sermons before, what we like to do is walk through books of the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And we've been in 1 Samuel now for a few weeks. To catch you up to date, God's people, the nation of Israel, they had a season after the time of Joshua where they were, they were ruled by judges. Some of you are familiar with the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, we see that God continues to raise up for the nation of Israel different judges to help deliver them from the issues that are going on. What happens is there's a cycle, as many of you know, in the book of Judges where God's people continually sin. They go away. They worship false gods, false idols. And then the Lord brings judgment on them by bringing in other nations. Then they, the nation of Israel cries out to God. They say, please, please, please help us. We're, we're never going to do that again. Come back and help us. And God delivers them by raising up a judge who leads them. And then the cycle continues over and over and over again. And at the end of that time is the story of Samuel, or 1 Samuel. Samuel would be the last judge. And as we've walked through over the last few weeks together, we saw that Samuel's birth was miraculous. It was a, a dark time in the nation of Israel. And Samuel himself is this light that God is bringing, this, this little glimmer of hope, if you will, for the nation of Israel. He comes to Hannah. She was not able to have children, and she makes a deal with the Lord. She says, Lord, if you will just give me a child, I will give him over to you, and he would serve you in the temple. And so the Lord does indeed bless her prayers and gives her Samuel. And she, after he is weaned, is given to the Lord, and he is at the temple with Eli. We're introduced to Eli after hearing Hannah's great prayer, which we learned a lot about God from her prayer. And we... we we're introduced to Eli, and as the text says, in Eli's worthless sons, who were also priests. And we saw that Eli himself was at times seemingly a good man who feared the Lord, and at times just, just not in touch with spiritual things and with truth. And he did not, he would not rebuke his sons rightly and make them stop being priests for the evils that they were doing. That would take us into... The latter part of chapter 2, where God then says, I am rejecting you, Eli, I'm rejecting your family, and I will bring on destruction on every one of your children and your family. And we talked about how that was a, a, a dark time for sure, but again, that glimmer of hope is still there because when God is, is tearing down evil and he is making sure that the, 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 the priest would no longer profane his name, he's also raising up Samuel. And so even though it's, uh, there are a lot of dark passages throughout, there's also hope. In chapter 3, we saw the call of young Samuel, teenage boy, 12 to 18 years old. At that time, he had been serving in the temple under Eli, and we see that the Lord calls him into his service. And then we spent last week in chapter 4, which was a very dark passage, where Samuel now is the one who is, is proclaiming, and the nation of Israel is listening to what he's saying to some degree, but then the Philistines, this, this evil group that continually battled God's people in this time, they come and they attack. And Israel was defeated. And the elders of Israel get together and they go, man, what happened? I mean, God's supposed to be with us. And so they were attacked, they lost, and they said, oh, you know what it was? We needed our, as one commentator put it, our lucky religious rabbit foot. We need the Ark of the Covenant to go with us. And now the Lord's name is on the line. It's his glory. This is his Ark, the representation of his presence. And so he's going to lead us into battle and we will win. And did they win? They did not. In fact, more were slain. God kept his word in Eli's sons who were the ones that brought the ark to the battle, which again, as I said before, if you were one of the Israelites and you know what those two guys have been up to in the temple and the tabernacle and they're leading the ark, man, I'd be calling in sick that day. I'm not ready to fight. I need to go somewhere else. God keeps his word. They're both killed. The ark is taken. And news comes to Eli, the high priest. He's, he's quite 
old now, and he was sitting and he was waiting to hear the news about the ark and about the battle. And this guy runs like 22 miles the same day, and he comes and he tells everybody what's happening, and the, and the whole town is in an uproar. And Eli says, come here, son, tell, tell me what happened. Tell me what happened. He says, we were demolished. Your sons are dead, and the ark is taken. And he seemingly has a heart attack or something at that moment, Eli does, and he falls over and he breaks his neck and he dies. And it doesn't even end there. The darkness in this passage did not even end there because then Eli's daughter-in-law, who was pregnant, she goes into labor and she ends up dying. And as the passage ended, 1 Samuel chapter 4, it says this, and she named the child Ichabod saying, the glory has departed from Israel because the ark of, God, ark of God had been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said again in verse 22, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. And that's where it ended. And I said to you, that is definitely a dark time, but what was remarkable is again, that glimmer of hope, that light was still there because there's a change happening. God said he was going to do this, and God always, always, always keeps his word. And that's an encouragement to God's people and to us. But likewise, this means now that Eli is gone, his sons are gone, and God's people are finally starting to maybe get it. They need to worship him the way that he says. They need to follow him. And Samuel is now the only one really left to lead God's people. So there's a change with some hope. But it leaves us at the end of chapter 4 begging the question, what about the ark? I mean, it's not like it wasn't important. The Ten Commandments inside, a little jar of manna, and this is an important thing. It, it showed the presence of God with His people. What about the ark? Read along with me silently as I read out loud 1 Samuel chapter 5, and that question will be answered to some degree for us today. Beginning in verse 1, when the Philistines captured the ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the truck of Dagon was left to him. This is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. The hand of the Lord was very heavy against the people of Ashdod. And he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. Verse 7. And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon, our God. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, what shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath. So they brought the ark of the God of Israel there. But after they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city causing a very great panic, and he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. But as soon as the ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, they have brought around us to us the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and our people. They sent, therefore, and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place that it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was very heavy there. 
The men who did not die were struck with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. Wow. Another very light passage this morning. <laughs> the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians says that the, the, the former things that were written are for our benefit. That means this passage, among all the passages in Scripture, are for our benefit. And so today, as we walk through the passage, we got to figure out, how does this help us? How does this apply to us? Holy Spirit, please help. Amen? Let's walk through it and see what we can find in the text. So the Philistines did something that is normal in the time. They, they defeated an enemy, and they took the religious kind of items any idols, anything like that of the, of, the other, of the other people's God, and they brought it with them to their temple. That was normal. That wasn't unique with what they were doing. But the reason that you do that is you are declaring victory, and you're saying, we're better than you, and our God or gods are stronger than your God. So they take the ark, and they're bringing it in, and they've got this guy, Dagon. There's some debate and discussion of where he comes from as far as this idol, this false god. Seems that he was actually part of another system, a pantheon of gods before. But the Philistines were sea people. And some say that Dagon kind of looked a little bit like a fish. Some say he's the, kind of the lord of the sea, the god of the sea, if you will, or maybe the god of harvest. There's some discussion, some debate. Doesn't matter. Ultimately, they had him set up. That's who they worshipped. That was their kind of high god is this Dagon. And so they take the ark, and they're going to bring it in. And you're going to just picture here for a moment. Dagon's right here, and they're putting the ark right next to Dagon, being like, yeah, Good job defeating the God of Israel. What else should they think? They brought out the ark. Israelites did that, right? They were roaring, hey, we're going to win. We've got the ark. And they dominated them. Little do the Philistines know that God is perfectly in control. And the only reason they won is because the Lord allowed it. That's it. That means, if you're not familiar with this word, that God is sovereign over everything. He is the one who is in charge. So in these first two verses, that's exactly what they're doing. They took the ark, they bring it in, and they set it up beside Dagon, and they had probably a big party. We are strong, and Dagon is the best. Walking around with their bumper stickers, I heart Dagon. <laughs> so they go to bed, and they wake up early the next morning, And they walk in the temple and Dagon's laying face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord. Can you imagine? <laughs> what kids were playing in here last night? Whose kids were in? What happened here? Maybe there's a strong wind. Something must have happened. Why, why would our Dagon be laying in front of the ark? You guys, they missed an opportunity for repentance. They missed it right there. God had shown them in that moment that guess what? Just because you defeat Israel, you do not defeat me. Side note, you guys do realize God doesn't need you for his victories, right? <laughs> right? Like, he takes care of all that. Our job, be faithful, follow him. He brings down all the other false gods. He brings down all the idols. He brings everyone down to lay at his feet. They miss the opportunity. Some of us miss the opportunity when we have these various idols in our life. These different things that we're worshiping, many times ourself, instead of following God. We're good with having God in our life, but like Dagon is, is there, and, and they're good with having, having the, the Ark of the Covenant there as long as it's under Dagon, under their God, under their idol. And many of us are the same way. We're good with having Jesus in our life. We're good with having his word as long as we're still going to do what we're going to do. He can just come along beside, even in our nation and in this world, it's okay for you to have God. And God we trust. But when you start to tell people what that means, you start to say, oh yeah, God says that what you're doing is evil and what you stand for is evil. All of a sudden, they don't like him so much anymore. See, that means you're not actually worshiping God. You're worshiping yourself. 
and as long as he agrees with you, you're okay. So they're okay with him being there. We've already defeated him. And so instead of taking that moment to repent and see the grace of God, here's what they do. Look what the text says. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. So many times God will come and he will break down your idol and instead of repenting, you take the idol and you put it right back up in its place. And that's what they did. Can you imagine this is your God? (laughs) Justin, give me a hand, man. We got to pick this thing up. Get him back up in his place. That's your God. You have to lift him up, get him back in his place. So they go to bed and they wake up the next morning. Just so you know, if you misunderstand the Lord, he'll make it clear to you. Verse 4, but when they rose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. Okay? And now the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. See, that was something that would happen at that time. When When you would win the battle, your captives, the way you would, part of what you would do to show everyone else that you won, you cut off hands, cut off heads, and carry them around. What does the Lord do to their God? Oh, you, you, you think your God's beaten me. Is that what you think? Because, because I gave you a victory over my people to teach them something greater and to teach my people for all time. You think you won? Go back in this morning and look at your God missing a head in his arms. No hands. If you didn't pick it up as we're reading through the text, you'll hear it more. And the hand of the Lord was heavy against them. Dagon doesn't even have any hands. He's a captive of Yahweh, the God of Israel. You have nothing, Dagon. Lying down, only the trunk of Dagon was left. And then this commentary comes in, because again, this was written a little after the time. So when this commentary comes in, it explains to us that at the time this was written, this is why, verse 5, priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. Even people, because the pieces were there, they would go and go, oh, I'm not stepping on that, I'm going over the threshold. God made a point and it carried on and echoes into history. That's the way he works. Verse 6, like I just pointed out, look what it says. The hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod. You did not repent. You and your pride think that you have won and now you will feel my heavy hand upon you. And he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. They're getting these tumors upon them, and we're seeing God judging sin here. Some of you have been reading in your study Bibles perhaps about this, and it'll get into a little bit next week, but mice are going to be mentioned as well. So some think that this is the bubonic plague perhaps that was happening to them. Whatever it is, it's the Lord working. He's the one doing it. So this goes on for a little bit, and you get into verse 7, and they go, man... It didn't take long to go, hey, wait a second now. The ark of the God of Israel can't stay here for his hand is hard against us and against our God, Dagon. They're like, he's he's stronger than us. He's stronger than our God. Get him out of here. Again, instead of going to him, they send him away. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines. Get all the lords together. What are we going to do about this? (laughs) So they say, well, let's let it go to another town. Maybe it's just like you guys in this town. Maybe it's the fact that Dagon was here. Let's, let's, let's go somewhere else. So they brought the ark of God to Gath. But after they had brought around in verse 9, the hand of the Lord, again, the hand of the Lord, Dagon has no hands, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing a great panic, and he afflicted the men in the city, both young and old, and tumors broke out on them too. You cannot run from God. You cannot send him away. He is everywhere and he is holy. And they're finding that out real quick. So you send him there, same thing's going to happen. So then they, verse 10, they sent the ark of God to Ekron. We're going to go to another town. Some of these are like 20 miles away. We're going to send it that direction. 10 miles away, send it that direction. Get it out of here. Get up to Chiefland. Take it over to Bronson. We don't want it around here. It's causing issues. people of Ekron, they cried out, they have brought around us to us the ark of God of Israel to kill us and our people. So what do they do? Another word. They sent, therefore, they're sending out, gathering together the Lord to say, send away the ark of God of Israel and let it return to its own place. Not even to another one of our cities. That's not working. Let's get it back to their people. 
that it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. And again, the hand of God was very heavy there. The men who did not die were struck with these tumors and the cry of the city went all the way up to heaven. Why did Israel fall? If this is how powerful God is, why in the world did Israel fall in the first place? It can't be that God's not powerful enough. He doesn't even need them and he's wiping them out. Why do we fall? Is it that our God is not powerful enough to help us? Congregation, is it? Is it? Yes or no? No. Okay. Two points. How about it's because the world's constantly against us? And so we would have victory over various idols and things in our life, but the world is too strong against us. Is that it? Spiritual warfare is too strong. Satan is too strong and he defeats us. Is that, is that it? 1 John 4, 3 and 4, little children, you are from God and have overcome them for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. It's not that our God's not powerful enough. It's not that the other gods are too powerful. It's not because the world's against us or spiritual warfare. Those things are true, but that's not why we fail. The reason we fail is our relationship with God is not right, just like Israel. We, like Israel, will forget our God. We compromise on small sin, which leads to greater sin. And we drift away and we quench the Spirit of God that lives inside of us and we fall. Thankfully, we don't have to stay there. We don't have to be a people who just send God away, who just run away from God. We're called to run to him in those times. A few truths I want to point out just in this passage for you that we see about God himself is that God is living. Dagon, not living. Our God is a living God. He's living and he's active and he's real. And some of you need to be reminded of that. Some of you may not even know it at all. Welcome. We want to introduce you to Jesus. He's amazing. Your God is living. He is active. Your God is the only true God. There are no other real gods. There are false gods. And every one of those false gods will end up like Dagon and nailing and bowing face down at our Savior's feet. False teachers, Muhammad, guess what? Bowing at Jesus' feet. Gandhi, bowing at our God's feet. It doesn't matter. Buddha doesn't matter. They all fall before our holy God. He wins. He is the only true God. We see in the passage, of course, that he is powerful and we see his holiness over and over and over again as he judges sin. That's what the cross is about. It really is his judgment for sin. It's his judgment on your sin, on my sin. But the glorious thing, as we were talking about in Sunday school in the youth, is the fact that that, that falls on Jesus. Jesus takes it for us. And so God remains holy because he judges sin and he shows that incredible love by sending Jesus to die for us. So we see that our God is a saving God as well. A few things I want you to take away from the passage. I've said some of them throughout, but I just have them here at the bottom of your notes to recap for you. Do not be like the Philistines and try to add the true God next to your false God, God or the false idols in your life. Don't do that. Take Dagon of your life off the idol. Put Jesus there. That's where he belongs. Don't try to, to make him fit together. It doesn't work that way. Remember that God will knock down your idols and give you a chance to repent. He is so gracious to us. If you do not, he will continue to destroy your idols. He will cut their heads off. He will cut their arms off. He will show you that he is God. When your idols get knocked down, don't put them back into place. When God works in you through the, the, the encouragement of brothers and sisters, when he shows you different things, don't take those idols and put them back in the place. When they fall, leave them down there. 
Number four, a few, another reminder here that God doesn't need you to fight for his glory. He will do that. You glorify him by following him. That's your job. Realize that the judgments of God that he brings are meant to drive us to worship him rightly. So when he disciplines, when there's judgment that happens because of sin, don't run away, don't send him away. Go to him and worship him rightly. And don't push God away. Instead, run to God. I want to tell you that by going to Mark chapter 5. Flip with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. This is where we'll end. Mark chapter 5. Jesus has been active in his ministry at this point in the Gospel of Mark. He's been telling various parables to his followers. He has just calmed a storm and he arrives on the other side of the sea here. Seemingly to a, a people that live here that were not Israelites. Mark chapter 5. This is a, an example of what we're talking about. So they came, beginning verse 1, they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He gets out of the boat. This guy has a, a demon inside of him. This guy lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with the chain. The demon was so strong. The idols in his life were so strong that you couldn't even bind him. He would just break them. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart. And he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had strength to subdue him. Nobody could help this guy. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Can you imagine? Now watch what happens when he encounters Jesus. Watch what happens. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What? Have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. This guy didn't have one demon going on. He had a legion, perhaps, of demons. And notice that even the demons know that Jesus is the Son of the Most High God. Do you see that? It's not a question of what do you know about Jesus. It's a question of do you submit and follow Jesus, and they don't do that. And this demon that's speaking, look what he says. Here. This is an interesting um, exchange here. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs and let us enter them. That's their idea. Don't send us away. Send us over to these pigs. Now what's interesting is they have to ask Jesus for permission. They have to ask him. He's still in charge. So he gives them permission. Well, why? I don't know. Research it. Why does he, why does he do that? I don't know. The text doesn't tell us why. They come up with the idea, he permits it, ultimately, because it will show more of his glory, and it helps this, this story continue here. Watch what happens. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank and into the sea and drowned in the sea. When you stay with the demons, when you stay with the idols, it leads to destruction every time. The herdsmen, the guys who just saw this whole thing take place, fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what has happened, right? Not much going on. All of a sudden you get, you get word that this, some guy's appeared and he's just, the, just passed some demons to the pigs. Pigs have died. Everyone's going, hey, this is something we need to go see. This was before Twitter, just so you know. They couldn't tweet about it. So they go and take a look. Now watch this. This is where the story gets even more heartbreaking. Watch. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had been, who had, had had the legion, sitting there, 
clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. The guy that everyone knows, they tried to shackle. He would break shackles. He cuts himself. He screams over and over again. He's sitting in his right mind, clothed at the feet of Jesus, and the people are scared. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And so they all fell at Jesus' feet and worshiped him right there, seeing his power and how he could heal, right? Is that what the text says? And did the same thing the Philistines did. And they began to, the ESV says, beg Jesus to depart from their region. God is giving chances. To some of you, he is giving chances. And some of you are, I'm just begging you to get away from me, God. Don't do it. Don't do it. As he is working Go to him like the the demoniac does. Not the rest of the people who are in their quote-unquote right mind. They see it, they're fearful, and they say, please, Jesus, get away from us. You've healed this guy. And as he was getting into the boat, he does, he leaves. The man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he could go with him. They're begging him to leave. This guy's begging, can I go with you, Jesus? Let me go with you. You've saved me. You've you've fixed me. Can I go with you anywhere you're going? Friends, is that you? Or is that you? You're like, Jesus, can I just be with you? I don't care where we're going, what we're doing. I want to be with you. Now, this is crazy. Verse 19. You think you would say, sure, get in the boat. Let's go, buddy. That's not what the text says. And Jesus did not permit him. But look what he told him to do. He said, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away, watch this, and began to proclaim to the Decapolis, which was the the 10 villages or cities in the area, how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. A few chapters later, we see that people come to faith through that guy. Why do I bring it up? Don't be like the people in the city. Don't be like the Philistines. When the Lord gives us opportunity and he shows us mercy, we run to him. We repent and we go to him. And then whatever he says, that's what we do. How do you find out what Jesus tells you? How do we know what Jesus' commandments are? Where do we find that, guys? Whatever he says about your life, about your relationships, about your job, about your church, about everything. It's whatever he says. And if the world doesn't like it, too bad. They're not going to like it, but here's our job. Stay there wherever he tells us and proclaim to them all that Jesus has done for us. And the hope is that through that they would come to faith. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this passage. Lord, we thank you for your work in us, in your people. God, we're thankful that you are holy. Lord, we're thankful that you are just, that you are righteous, and that you are loving and merciful and gracious to us, and we see those things perfectly at the cross. They come together and display your glory. So Lord, in each one of our lives, for those who have have never truly followed you here, Lord, they've never really believed in Christ. I pray that they would do so today. And Lord, for the rest of us who at times are just worshiping false idols and gods in our lives, Lord, would you, by your spirit, work in us that we would repent of those. Lord, we're asking you, crush the idols. Crush them in our hearts. Crush them in our lives. And point us to a greater hope. Help us to be in our right mind, at your feet, in your word, learning from you, going wherever you want us to go, doing whatever you tell us to do. Make that true in us. In Jesus' name, amen.